What a powerful, powerful moment of worship. He is with us. And and church family, I've got to let you know that over the past few weeks, that has been a message that has never been stronger than it has for us in this moment right now. We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of your prayers, your thoughts, your support, your concern over these past few weeks, over the next few weeks, over the next coming months. On behalf of our family and on behalf of the Hazard family, a huge, huge thank you to to our church family because you've acted like a church family and supported us during this difficult, difficult season. Yeah, I just want to extend our deepest thanks and wish everybody a happy Father's Day. Um, it's a bit of a bittersweet day for me as Dad went home just over three weeks ago. Um, and it's been a journey for our family since he was uh, diagnosed with cancer two years ago. Um, we had, my dad and I had many significant conversations when he was uh, sick. And one that will forever stand out is um, uh, a time when he looked at me and told me that he had to come to the realization that his earthly father is a good man. My grandfather was such a great man. But his earthly father was not his true father. His heavenly father was his true father. And before we had had that conversation in my own time with Jesus, as I had been wrestling through what was happening with dad and the very real um, uh, likelihood that he would be going home uh, with Jesus, there was one quiet morning where I was telling my dad, uh, telling God actually that I can't, I can't lose my dad, like I can't do that. And in his quiet and gentle way, he whispered and said, yes, you can lose your earthly father because I am, I am your true father. I am your heavenly father. And as I was having this other conversation with my earthly dad, it was a confirmation of what the Lord had spoken to my own heart. Um, and in that moment with that conversation with dad, I looked at him and it was, we were both crying. And it was very a very significant moment for both of us and I looked at him and I said dad I love you but you are not my true father and my dad looked at me and he said yes you're right and that's good so for those of you who have lost a father like I have who have an absent father who long to be a father um, there's so many who've lost a child all of these things are uh, significant there's lots of pain that can happen in these moments and in these days but we have a Heavenly Father who knows us by name and who loves us far more than we can imagine. And so our guest speaker today is my dad. And last year at Father's Day, he taped a message for us because we were also in the middle of COVID lockdown. And we thought it would be a great, uh, a great uh, and powerful thing just to replay that message for you today. It is a message about... Um, uh, just the failures of father fathering as earthly fathers and how we need to look to our Heavenly Father in all things. Um, so the Lord loves you far more than you can imagine and He is with us like Josh said and how Steve and Jenna sang so beautifully and so happy Father's Day. Good morning friends. I need to begin with a confession this morning. My confession is that after pastoring and serving in the church for over 40 years, I come to these special days, Mother's Day, Father's Day, with mixed emotions. On one hand, I'm delighted to celebrate and honor the significant person that we are recognizing. Today, we're recognizing our Father. But on the other hand, I'm well aware of the challenges and the personal pain and disappointment that some carry on these special days. There are fathers today who carry personal pain. There are children who have been disappointed in the journey of their lives in their family. And there are individuals who perhaps desired to be a father, but life circumstances interrupted the dream. And there are so many other situations in life that can cause us some discomfort on these special days. So some simply avoid any celebration. But I appreciate the wisdom and the encouragement of Ephesians chapter 6 verses 2 and 3 that simply say, honor your father and mother. 
which is the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So I wish to honor fathers today. And I would encourage you to honor your father today. And if you are a father, to sit back and relax and enjoy the appreciation of your family as they share that with you. So let me encourage you to buy that gift, send that card, make that call, visit that gravesite, and honor, honor your father today. My father passed away just over seven years ago, and I had the privilege of visiting his gravesite uh, yesterday, remembering so many of the great lessons in life that he taught me. And I thought to honor him as I shared the word. He was a Christian man who loved the word and was often invited to speak and preach. And so to honor him today, I thought I would wear one of his favorite shirts and, uh, and recognize and honor my own father on Father's Day as I share the word with you this morning. As we find meaningful ways to honor our father today, however... I invite us to also reflect on a very, very profound but overlooked family passage found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. Let me read this passage to you, but I invite you to listen carefully to what Peter said to the early church nearly 2,000 years ago as we make application of this passage in our hearts and lives and family life today. Since you call on a father who judges each, person, each person's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another, including family members, deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I want you to think with me about the phrase made in verse 18, where the apostle Peter makes this unique statement that you were redeemed I was redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to us, to me, from our forefathers. Let's think about that. He begins by mentioning we have been redeemed. One of the great truths of the New Testament is this truth of being redeemed. It simply means that we have been bought back. And a listener in the first century would be well acquainted with the slavery culture of their day and how individuals had been bought and sold on markets and how through Christ's blood we have been purchased back by God and purchased for God through the significant sacrifice of Jesus. We have been redeemed, bought back. But we have been redeemed from something. Notice with me a couple of passages of scripture that talk about how we have been redeemed. 
In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, it says that we are redeemed from all wickedness. Again, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. In Hosea verse 13, chapter 13, verse 14, it tells us that we have been redeemed from death itself. Now, just hold on to that verse because I'm going to come back to that at the conclusion of uh, our message this morning. And then in this passage that we're, we're discussing this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, Peter writes that we have been redeemed, we have been bought back, we have been brought out of the empty way of life that was handed down to us by our forefathers. That is such an interesting statement. It's such a unique commentary on the journey of our lives, and it's filled with such honesty and such potential for us to understand life far more deeply. At first, it seems disrespectful to look back on perhaps what our, our parents and forefathers, our father, has given to us as an inheritance and say that part of it is empty. But it's important to recognize that the scripture is endeavoring to lead us to the fullness of life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And he does it by bringing truth to every situation and every relationship, including our relationship with our parents. And today, we're talking about our relationship with our father. Deeper examination uh, offers, as we think about being redeemed from the empty way of life handed down by our forefathers, that there's a profound and humbling insight into life and relationships. But there's even deeper gratitude that can grow in our hearts for the Lord, and especially for Jesus Christ, who redeems us. And the message this morning, I hope you realize that you have been redeemed from more than perhaps you're even aware of. We've been redeemed from sin. We've been redeemed from, from death. We've been redeemed from things that have come to us even through the journey with our parents. We all have received an inheritance from our parents. We've received life, but that inheritance also includes a portion of, of emptiness. The context that Peter is speaking to in this chapter is the Jewish law itself. He's endeavoring to communicate that God's people have been delivered from the slavery of legal obedience to a system of religion and they have now, through Jesus' shed blood, been brought into this living new covenant in which Jesus puts the law of God in our hearts and upon our minds. He has taken away our heart of stone, as the prophet Ezekiel said. He has given to us a heart of flesh. And there has been this incredible transformation that has come to us as we recognize Christ's redemption and the Spirit's power. This is amazing. We have been redeemed to an entirely new way of life. And the first century listeners would realize that the Apostle Peter was, was identifying that the way of life handed down to them by their forefathers was the religious system of Judaism that had the law but not the Spirit. But now, as children of the new covenant, redeemed by Jesus Christ, purchased by His precious blood, they are part of this new community, this new family. And they have been redeemed from that way of emptiness that had been passed down to them through their Jewish forefathers. Now, you may be listening today, and you would 
perhaps have received a system of religious thought and ideas that have been passed down through your family, through your father, through your mother, through your grandparents. Some of it may be correct. Other parts of it may be incorrect. And this passage of Scripture invites you to stop and look at the truth of who Jesus is and ensure that what you know about God and what you believe about God aligns with what Jesus taught rather than what you have inherited from your forefathers. This is an incredibly freeing and an incredibly important uh, conversation because what we believe about God determines how we live. It determines how we relate to one another. And perhaps as you're listening today, you need to ponder how your parents, well-meaning as they perhaps have been, perhaps dropped into your heart or into your mind ideas that need to be discerned today and corrected today in light of all that Jesus has provided uh, for us. We all have received empty inheritances. It's interesting that when uh, the Apostle Peter makes references to these empty inheritances, he's referring to patterns of life. In fact, this phrase, the patterns of life uh, passed down to us, is a very common phrase used by Peter in his two letters. He uses this phrase, patterns of life, 13 times. And he identifies that While you and I have been part of a a previous pattern of life, we now engage a new pattern of life as God's people, part of a new kingdom with a new heart and a new spirit within us, as Ezekiel promised. And the power of previous patterns is so strong that Peter is recognizing that there needs to be a redemption, a powerful breaking away, a redeeming to bring us out of yesteryear's patterns of life and be brought into the newness of all that Christ has provided for us. I simply want to make application today of a couple of ways we can be influenced by our forefathers in ways that we may even be subconscious to, we may not be fully aware of it, but yet they can deeply influence us and cause us to live our lives in a certain amount of frustration and futility. And we need Christ to redeem us from those dimensions. Let me talk first of all about worldview. I've already mentioned how in families, a perspective of life, a perspective of God is passed down from generation to generation. This is called worldview. And we are grateful for the many things that our parents have taught us. I'm grateful that my parents taught me the importance of, uh, of being kind to others, of respecting other people and their property. I'm grateful that I was taught through the community, the larger community of the Hazard family, that I was significant, I was valuable, I was important because I was alive. And there are so many good things that have been taught as that worldview has uh, infiltrated my heart. I was taught things like uh, generosity being very important. I was taught things like honoring elders uh, as something of great importance. But I also recognize that my parents were human beings and they represented ideas at times that through the course of time, they actually changed their mind on they actually came to a greater understanding of certain things. And the things that, that I perhaps had been taught in my earlier years had shifted and changed. And it's those things that as we grow in life that we need to be able to discern 
as, as containing emptiness, a, a, a legacy of emptiness, as the Apostle Peter is mentioning to us. We all are vulnerable to them, and we all have the, uh, the potential of not only receiving them, but as a human father with four children of my own, I'm also well aware of the fact that I can pass on dimensions of emptiness, even in my well-being attempts to raise them well. I have the vulnerability as a human being to pass along ideas or feelings or attitudes that may not reflect the full kingdom that Jesus has called me to participate in. Let me illustrate. I find it absolutely fascinating that as we read through the book of Acts, we see that the early church, after the early church had been redeemed by Jesus Christ, they were followers of Jesus. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they were people who were filled with the Spirit. They, they were empowered by the, the indwelling Holy Spirit who enabled them to do incredible things for God. You read it in Acts chapter 2. And yet by Acts chapter 6, we see the same group of believers having to deal with racial conflict in the early church. And then in Acts chapter 15, they're having to deal with their own prejudices again. The point that is being made is that even though Christ indwells us, even though the power of the Spirit is with us, we need to carefully discern how prejudices that are either born within us or have been delivered to us through the families that we have been raised in can take root and if we are not careful with them, actually bring fruit. We're watching this in our culture today. And it's important that as we look at racism in our culture today, we recognize that we're all vulnerable. And we all need to respond appropriately. I find it fascinating that in the early church, uh, the racial issues were part of what they had to wrestle with. But thank God, they were able to, as they understood the foundations of Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28, that Christ had redeemed them from that. Listen to what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3. For you are all sons, or you are all daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are one in Christ. And that is what we have been redeemed to. We've been redeemed from prejudice. And we have been redeemed to a place of expressing dignity and respect to one another. I think that, uh, that we can see that perhaps through uh, our family journey, we have developed attitudes toward money and finances. And some people are very conscious of the amount of money they have or they do not have. And Jesus, as we are redeemed into his kingdom, provides for us an entirely new way of looking at something as strong and powerful as money. Jesus himself said, you cannot serve two masters. You will either love God or you will love money. But we absorb attitudes toward finances, often through the family structure that we are raised in. And Jesus wants to redeem us from those patterns and bring us to a whole new pattern of kingdom understanding of, of finances and live in the freedom of generosity. You know, some families put a high value on 
pleasure. Pleasure is good. I call it the salt and pepper of life. We all need some seasoning at times. But there are some families and some influences brought on the children of families where it appears as though that pleasure is why we exist. And the scripture would challenge us and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's an empty way of life that you perhaps have perceived and received from your forefathers. Your life is far more valuable and far more important than simply living out uh, a life looking for and seeking pleasure. Pleasure has its value, but there's purpose that we have in Christ that lifts us beyond that constant addiction that we can have in seeking pleasure. From our families, we can receive an understanding of power in relationships where control is provided by the person who has power. Where in Jesus' kingdom, we are called to be people who serve. Married couples are called to serve one another and to submit to one another. Children are called to serve and honor each other and their parents. Parents are called to serve and give wise counsel to their children. So in a godly family, we have been released from the power control pattern of life to serving one another in love as Jesus has, has taught us. So in Galatians chapter 3, we are all sons of God, daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that gives us the ability to look at life to look at circumstances, to look at all that we have received in the course of our life and discern those things that are good and celebrate them. And I trust you do celebrate them today. But also discern ways, perhaps, that you have received dimensions of emptiness from your forefathers. I believe that one of the dimensions of emptiness that people, children can receive from forefathers is the way they will cope in life. It's fascinating how children mimic parents in their reactions to life. We can offer self-confidence or we can offer and transmit a sense of doubt in, in situations. Courage can be inherited from our forefathers, but so can fear and so can timidity. McLean's magazine, just a couple of months ago, ran a very interesting article. And at, you know at the end of McLean's magazine, just inside the back cover, they often will uh, tell the story of a Canadian, just ordinary Canadians. I read the story of an ordinary Canadian and how he influenced uh, his family. His name um, was Bert Demings. And Bert Demings and his wife had four children. Tragically, Bert Demings' wife passed away of cancer when she was 49 years of age. And Bert Demings was left raising his family alone. It's interesting, and the, the article in McLean's magazine was written as Bert Demings was now 99 years of age. And his son wrote the article. And his son acknowledged that somehow dad communicated to those four children that they would, they would, quote, somehow get through this together. And he communicated to those four children that had just lost their mom, and he would have been a heartbroken uh, husband and a father wondering, how am I going to raise these children? Rather than communicate fear, he communicated faith. And he said, we're going to get through this together. And at his 99th birthday, his son said that 
what our father passed down to his four children was tenacity. I like the article because it doesn't matter what situation we face in life. There's always an inheritance that we are passing along. I understand that the Deming family's journey is not everybody's journey. We've all received different things through the circumstances of life. But let me remind you of what 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God, who is our Father, He has not given to us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and of power and a sound mind. And as we are connected to God through Jesus Christ, we also receive His inheritance of faith and hope and love and that can transcend us above some of the inheritances that we have received from our earthly parents. You know, it's interesting how children can mimic the emotional uh, responses of parents. As parents have sought to uh, react in situations, we can re respond and react in anger or through silence, and children pick that up. And that is carried through various generations. The good news is, Jesus can deliver us from that inheritance that we have received as we have observed our parents trying to do their best in challenging situations, but perhaps not giving us the full message of of how we can respond appropriately. And then there are various psychological coping mechanisms where in pressure, in tension, we can tend to avoid crucial conversations that if we would simply engage them well, engage them graciously, it would release us to whole new levels of understanding and love with our, our marriage partner, with our children, within our families. But unless we engage those challenging conversations, we will continue to live lives less than God intended. Thank God we've been delivered from empty ways of life, silent treatment, uh, anger, and we can engage one another and speak from our hearts, speak the truth in love as we grow together in him, Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. You know, let me pause briefly and become a bit personal because one of the things we see in families is vulnerability to substance abuse. I want to tell you the story of a member of my family. His name is Roland Hazard III. I have been doing some research on my family uh, tree, and I came across Roland Hazard. You may see on the screen that his name is spelled with one Z, and that's how our name was spelled a few generations ago. Roland Hazard was a well-to-do businessman in New York. He came from the Hazard family, which had settled in Rhode Island, and he migrated into New York, likely from his father or grandfather, and was in the textile industry. He was well-to-do. He lived in the 1920s and was at the top of his economic game then. However, he had a problem. And his problem was he was vulnerable to substance abuse. He was vulnerable to alcohol. And he became an alcoholic. Roland Hazard was so deeply affected by alcoholism that he was in and out of various sanatoriums in the early uh, 1920s. Part of, you know, in the culture of the roaring 20s where parties were just normative. And he became so distraught with his life that he actually booked an appointment with Carl G. Jung, the Swiss psychoanalyst, who met with him in Switzerland, and he said to Roland Hazard, he said, I have never seen anyone so helplessly addicted to alcohol, and unfortunately, there is nothing I can do for you. 
He said, your only hope is to find a religious community and experience and have a vital spiritual experience. Roland Hazard left um, uh, Switzerland, came back to New York, and connected with the Oxford group, which was a group of Christians in New York at the time, who believed that Jesus could redeem us from anything. And Jesus could save us from anything. Roland committed his life to Christ. And as a result of his walking with the Lord and his walking with a community, he experienced freedom, not perfect freedom, but for the, the rest of his life, he experienced the majority of freedom from alcoholism. Jesus redeemed him. He was vulnerable because alcohol was just part and parcel of his family journey. But he came to the place where he recognized he needed help above and beyond what he had received, the emptiness, if I can call it that, that had been passed down to him from his forefathers. Roland is part of my family tree. I tell you this story because as a result of that group coming together, Roland shared with a friend, Ebby Thatcher, what God had done in his life. Ebby Thatcher shared with another friend, Bill Wilson, who was also an alcoholic, what God had done in his life. Bill Wilson is the founder of Alcoholic Anonymous. And Roland Hazard, if you look in the, in the history of Alcoholic Anonymous, you will recognize the name Roland Hazard. He is an individual that Carl Jung mentioned in a letter written to William Wilson back in 1961. All that I am trying to say is that regardless of what we have received, regardless of emptiness that maybe has influenced us or vulnerability in our lives to whatever historic family patterns there may have been, Peter gives us hope this morning. And Peter reminds us that he, Jesus, has delivered us, has redeemed us, has set us free from empty ways of life handed down to us by our forefathers. That requires incredible humility to recognize that we as human beings are all vulnerable to our own humanity. And we all need greater strength than we have in and of ourselves. The law simply identifies our places of weakness. But it's in Christ that the Spirit has been given to empower us to rise above whatever the area of vulnerability is and to live in the freedom and to live in the truth that is found in Jesus Christ. That's why the Apostle Peter said, hey, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, not through silver and gold, but through something even more valuable, more precious. And he allows us to live our lives freely and fully apart from any areas of vulnerability that we either intuitively have as a human being or has been passed along to us uh, from our forefathers. Let me close by saying the Apostle Peter, he not only mentions, you know, our vulnerability to what has come to us from our forefathers, but in the passage of Scripture, he outlines how we are all vulnerable to this thing called death. And he speaks to an inheritance that all of us have received from our forefathers, and that's our own mortality. And he reminds us that all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers 
fall. But the word of our God endures forever. Hear me, friends. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the greatest inheritance of emptiness that we have all received from our forefathers. Yes, we've received life, but we've all received death. And in Jesus Christ, we are able to look at death with its potential confusion, its potential questions, its potential emptiness, and say, wait, Christ has brought me from a former pattern into a new pattern. And when Jesus said in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life, because I live, you shall live also, we can trust in that. Jesus Christ is Lord of life. And we can say like the Apostle Paul, there, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Can hardship? Can death? No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, John said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And Jesus answers the greatest potential emptiness that all of us have received, our own mortality, our own humanity, by rising from the dead and saying to us, because I live, you shall live also. Friends, on this Father's Day, I simply want to remind us that Jesus provided more for us in his death and in his resurrection than we at times understand. And let's just pause and ponder again what the Apostle Peter said, that he, Jesus, has redeemed us from every empty way of life handed down to us by our forefathers so that we can live in freedom, we can live in joy, and we can live in peace today. And we can walk in humility knowing that as earthly fathers, we're passing on life, but we're also passing on dimensions of emptiness, attitudes perhaps, actions perhaps to our children that they can be delivered from also. That's why everyone needs Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And ultimately, to know that even in death itself, which is an inheritance, it's a legacy that we have all received, that we can live in the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. The greatest inheritance that the next generation receive from us isn't what they receive in the reading of a will after we pass away. It's their observations of how we exercise our will and the choices we have made in life. And that is powerful. It's powerful to the degree that the Apostle Peter said, and some of those parental influences we need to be redeemed from. So thank God for Jesus. And I say to you, happy Father's Day. Honor your father today, but live in the freedom that your heavenly father provides for you through Jesus Christ our Lord.